mention how honored I was to actually have been the inaugural um, Marty Keel lecture at Minding Animals in New Delhi. And we're hoping to start a new tradition where the previous um, Marty Keel lecturer will introduce the next Marty Keel lecture um, and wherever Minding Animals will be next. Um, so hopefully Carol will do that. Before I introduce Carol, who really needs no introduction, I want to just say a little bit about who Marty Keel was um, and her importance in thinking about um, feminist concerns for animal rights. She was actually the founder of Feminists for Animal Rights um, and was a, a committed and bold um, activist but she was also a really inspirational theorist, and she was quite inspirational for me. In the very early days, she wrote a very brave piece called um, Animal Liberation, a Circular Affair, in which she was trying to suggest that the debates between environmental ethics and animal ethics needn't be thought to be um, at odds. And I found that really inspiring. That work ultimately became a dissertation for her, and she wrote a wonderful book called nature ethics. Um, and she, if you don't know her work, I really want to encourage you um, to take a look at it. And it's quite an honor for us to be able to honor her um, at this um, Marty Keel lecture. And this year's Marty Keel lecturer is Carol Adams, who, as I said, really ne needs no introduction. Um, she's a vision visionary ecofeminist writer. Her sexual politics of meat was really um, change the way we think about connections uh, between all different forms of oppression, the oppression of women, the oppression of um, non-normative gender expression, the oppression of various um, people of different races, and of course, the oppression of animals. Um, I'm going to not take up much more time so that Carol can get started. Can you move away? Thank you, Carol. Good morning. Got to get my watch in place. I wanted to make a couple announcements for, for all of you. The first is, while you can see who the invited talks are, if you want to know the titles for the invited talks, it's in this sheet of paper that's in front of your booklet. So I know that the names are all familiar to you, but if you want to know more and have to make a very difficult decision, do that. I want to thank Anna Christina as well. What, a, what, what an indomitable force who came up against many, many, many forces that wanted to defeat her. I want to thank Paulina for the hospitality of this university and Rod for holding it all together. I thank Lori for her work, her important friendship with me and Marty, and um, her ongoing support of ecofeminist writings. I want you to know that the Board of Directors of Minding Animals has adopted a diversity and inclusion policy for Minding Animals. This policy is on the website under the po Policies tab. I know you can't access it right now. But we want you to know we want this place and this time to be a safe and inclusive environment in which everyone feels comfortable. And if you have any significant issues, you should feel free to e email our disputes council at mindinganimals at gmail.com, mindinganimals at gmail.com. Or you may also approach a board member to talk with us uh, if there is any issue you wish, which, uh, wish us to address. Finally. Thanks to a donation from someone who loved Marty, we have these books available for graduate students, undergraduates, postdocs, and activists. If you did not get your book last night, we have them in the front, uh, right you know, before you go get your coffee. I got to sign some books. Don't hesitate to get Lori's signature, too. She's here till next week. OK, mongrel honesty. Mongrel Honesty, The Politics of Purity in Oppressive Times. 
So, greetings from the resistance in the United States. Like many others, I'm a mongrel in the resistance, being both a vegan and a feminist social justice activist. I wish they were synonymous, vegan and feminist social justice. And some of us are working on that. At this time, each identity, vegan and feminist social justice activist, are held in a delicate dance of critiquing the other. And here's the thing, Marty Keough recognized that. This is when I met Marty in 1990 at the first march uh, for the animals. Marty's contextual ethical approach described how truncated narratives work. Wrenching an ethical problem out of its embedded context severs the problem from its roots. In a sense, we are given truncated stories and then asked what we think the ending should be. However, if we do not understand the worldview that produced the dilemma that we are asked to consider, we have no way of evaluating the situation except on its own terms. Before we ended up with a president of the United States and staff who lie, outright lie, we had truncated, incomplete narratives that determined frameworks that limited insights and discussions. Marty identified that. The term mongrel references animality in connotation and denotation. I want to affirm the mixing that mongrel means while refusing the negative applications that attach to this. Specifically, mongrel honesty is my response to one truncated narrative, purity, and the counter-purity narratives that decontextualize our lives. I'll suggest a few of these counter-purity narratives here and return to them. How can you defend veganism when there are food deserts? Note, some have critiqued the term food desert for inappropriately using a kind of terrain that is not actually unnatural to represent a conscious failure to invest in low-income neighborhoods. As a whole, I don't think it's vegans who failed to invest in low-income neighborhoods. That veganism is white, because apparently our critics only read the gossip pages about white vegan celebrities and not books or noticed websites like Black Vegans Rock. Veganism is hard. We'll return to this. Vegans are exterminists. It's really soy and almond milk that's destroying the environment. The result is that a river of disdain and disparagement runs through the term purity that couples with the idea that we vegans are the pure ones. We are the ones destroying the environment for humans and non-humans. My title is inspired by this book, Terrible Honesty, Mongrel Manhattan in the 1920s. It's a wonderful and vital book. During the 1920s, the United States became an urban nation, with New York the largest city in that urban nation. Simultaneously, there was a recognition that African American heritage of folk and popular art was at least as long and comprehensive as any white American could boast. The author describes how conservative race ideologues of that day used the word mongrelization to describe with horror the imminent era of miscegenation. Douglas's goal was to show how at the moment that America at large was separating itself culturally from England and Europe, okay, and she uses America because she says it was more uh, cohesive than the United States, but all of us know that for the United States to take the word America completely disregards Mexico and Canada. So I'll just want a footnote, I don't agree with her. Um, she says, black America in an inevitable corollary movement was recovering its own heritage from dominant white culture. What is known as the Harlem Renaissance was a part of this, but also the introduction of the blues to a wider audience through the appearance of 78 records. And uptown Manhattan became a black metropolis. The honesty part, it's a phrase from the mystery writer Raymond Chandler. He called terrible honesty 
to name an ethos of accuracy, precision, perfect pitch, and timing. My goals are not literary historical, whoops, but political social, to place veganism and animal activism within the resistance against right-wing developments, not only in the United States, but especially in the United States. Purity and its corollary charges make veganism seem to be regressive, more aligned with the right wing than resisting it. And that's very ironic because the right wing's current favorite insult for ter liberals is soy boy. Uh, if, you tweet, if you tweet, just follow the hashtag soy boy, which is based on the fall that soy causes feminization of men. And it gives a whole new meaning to the sexual politics of meat. These are the kind of um, liberals, I mean, conservative views of, of vegan men. Um, but I don't need to tell you about that. So purity is always scanning for lack. A mongrel lacks parents of the same breed. A vegan lacks non-vegan foods. I could not give up my hamburger. An unwed mother lacks legitimacy. A vegan lacks enough protein or lacks complete protein. <laughs> so you get the idea. The mongrel is the trickster, throwing off bloodlines and pure breeds. Besides the fact that breeding animals creates pet overpopulation, it also creates a tendency to certain malformations in dogs. Throughout my life, mongrels appeared in our town. It was suspected they were being dropped off from Buffalo, New York, the city 40 miles away. This dog, my childhood dog, Cyrano de Dog, turned up one day in 1962. What kind of dog is he, we would be asked. Dog by committee, we might have said, because his tail answered one way and his snout another. He was both, he was all, he was merrily mongrel. In my childhood, go home, Sereno, were the three most useless words in the English language. He was a slayer of pride and also a persistent porcupine predator. Losing not once but twice to the quill-equipped prey in one summer, we had to have him anesthetized to have the quills removed from his nose. The artist who lived across the street from us loved to add him to paintings. Can you see him running there? And she even sculpted him. He has survived all these years and lives in my study, though he lost a part of his head at some point. I began to consider the issue of purity versus mongrelization after what had started as an innocent meetup for coffee. I was meeting two professors for coffee and bagels near the campus where one of them teaches. It was the morning after my sexual politics of meat slideshow presentation on the campus. The two people I was meeting have contributed to animal studies in substantive ways. And I'm going to leave it that indistinct. By the time I got there, they had gotten their bagels, coffee, and a table. It was a crowded place in the morning, and one of them waited in line with me. As I got to the front of the line to make my order, this person pointed out how delicious the specialty cream cheese of the day was. And just like that, the chasm between us appeared. The scholar only recognized the chasm later at the table as the two of them discussed the taste of their cream cheese on their bagels and how delicious it was. And then they looked at my hummus. So they looked at me, arrested in their bites of their bagels, and how did they explain the chasm? By referring to my veganism as purity. I might have said to the two scholars, I, I guess you haven't read my book, and just left at that, but I did not. The idea of purity implies, to begin with, that we vegans are Don Quixotes tilting at their own windmills when our time is needed elsewhere, perhaps on protest lines. How is a practice made rigid, unrealizable, and undesirable 
when a suspected attribute becomes the accepted yet dishonest way for that practice to be discussed. Now, there have been some answers to the purity discourse by very talented scholars. Eva Girard suggests it is epistemolo epistemologically disruptive veganism, challenging traditional humanist hierarchies and unsettling the ways that certain groups are designated as legitimately exploitable. Richard Twine argues further that veganism is not conceived by its practitioners as a manifesto for purity, nor as an ethical endpoint, but as an ongoing everyday ethics which attempts to commit the least harm within complex contemporary systems of production and consumption. And film scholar Annette Pick suggests that veganism is in its very incompleteness and imperfection a conscious participation in the world. She argues that veganism is a labor of love and justice, one which works hard to see clearly not only the webs of interspecies relations as they are, but also as they could be. The work of justice, Pick suggests, necessarily entails some untying of knots. These are all excellent and thoughtful responses, and maybe I could have left the argument to them. But then this past year, two books came out, and the authors appeared to see themselves as offering a middle way, reassuring everyone, you can care about animals, but you don't have to become a vegan. In their promotion of the books, the authors appeared to perform stereotyping and shaming of vegans, allowing for the idea that vegans are not just purists, but were really angry, absolutist, difficult purists to boot. We make non-vegans uncomfortable. These authors suggested that they were here to make non-vegans comfortable, because vegans can be so aggressive. It seemed they were going to rescue their listeners and readers from veganism and vegans. So I challenged one author for blaming the victim and perpetuating stereotypes. And when I talked with the other, he said, do you know how many meat eaters t confide to me that they've been attacked by vegans? And I said, did you ever ask them what they said to the vegan before they felt attacked? And he never had. So they came up, they seem to be holding to this continuum. And it might be described like this. You know, there's meat and dairy and egg eating, and then there's compromise, and then there's vegan purity. So vegan purity, we're angry, intolerant, argumentative, but compromise, gentle, understanding, kind, not demanding, listening. So they put us, you know, just further down this very linear way of conceptualizing change. According to others, vegans are thought to refuse compromise. Now, in the United States, compromise is already a word burdened by how the dominant culture labeled it. When the Constitution allowed for slaves to be seen as three-fifths of a person, that was called a compromise. That was a concession to the slave states. Compromises throughout the 19th century about slavery were called compromises when they were actually concessions. So when I hear this, I'm say, I think what they're saying to us is that we aren't willing to make their kind of compromise. But let's remember that classifying is the work of the colonial state. And the fact is, we compromise all the time when we are eating with someone eating dairy or meat. Those compromises can be traumatic, and we stomach the trauma to be effective or polite. So if we were purists, we would not be eating in public with non-vegans for non-vegans to confront us that we're purists. So let's remember it's 2018. Those with the privilege of living in developed countries and being writers, commentators, academics should be acknowledging that they understand how veganism is part of social change and recognize the deceptiveness of their supposed counter-purity arguments. And I'm going to divide their purity arguments into four problems. Purity and political meaning. 
Like deciding what is human, those in control, those with dominance decide what is pure. Purity is first and foremost a racial discourse. It isn't some free-floating concept like a fetus in anti-abortion images floating in space unanchored to a body. Purity is anchored to bodies, white bodies. For instance, things like, right, I mean, there's just so many writings. Races cannot be cross-bred without mongrelization any more than dogs. This writer, Kenneth Roberts, went on to write Northwest Passage, and someone has itemized how many sort of folksy websites still cite that novel, still sell it, like all things, uh, not uh, like Prairie Home Companion in the United States. And this man was so against multi interracial relationships. In the United States, after the Civil War, Southern racist laws and legal opinions changed. Before the war, persons who were one-eighth black were legally white. And there was also a custom of saying white by reputation in the community. But that all dropped after the Civil War. Then the one drop rule replaced it. If you had one drop of black blood, you, that made you black. So one black ancestor, no matter how distant, could convey a permanent so-called taint of blackness that made one a Negro. This was this new purity uh, elevated to a, a new level in the US. So purity is an obsession of dominance. And the white race is pure and needing to protect it with border walls, et cetera. So, the anti-immigrant, oh, and purity needs to be protected. So what does that lead us to? It leads us to the current status of the United States with a border wall needed between us and Mexico, with, with uh, Trump char characterizing countries with people of color as shitholes, but white countries like Norwege, Norway as not. That's all part of purity. Uh, it's joining a larger discussion tainted by racism and hysteria about immigration. Mongrel honesty knows we aren't in pursuit of purity. An offshoot of the charge of purity is the charge that veganism is a white thing, ignoring vegans of color and their writings. So I actually have the book here, and I'm going to tell you it's for sale outside at the Lantern Book uh, table. This book, Breeze Harper on uh, Black Female Vegans Speak on Food, Identity, Health, and Society, and Afroism, this incredible new book that's also for sale outside for those of you who want to uh, learn more about the dynamic work of uh, black feminists. Making them invisible is a sign of ignorance but it's a way of holding on to a, a stereotype notion of what vegans are about. But for goodness sakes, even the New York Times has noticed something is going on here. I think we need to notice it too in our conversations. In Afroism, Aff and Silco write that they see black veganism as a socio-political movement that rearticulates black oppression through the lens of animality and race. Black veganism is a methodological tool to reactivate our imaginations. This tool can bring down the master's house because what they're saying is that racism is simultaneously anti-black and anti-animal as seen by racial ideologies, elevation and celebration of the human and humanity, particularly as Western and white. So they see the conceptions of humanity and human and animality and animal constructed along racial lines. As a result, animals did not inform our notion of animality. Animality informed our notions of animals. Aff elaborates, assuming animals are disposable is actually a product of being colonized by white supremacist patriarchy. And Eurocentric veganism distorts our ability to hear Aff and Sill by creating a vegan practice that uses comparisons, analogies, 
and discussions of similarities in treatment that lead differences in oppressive practices and structures. So, you know, to begin with, racist oppression is not an example to be exploited for the liberation of other animals. It's an important aspect of understanding how animality carries race within it. I want black vegan feminist theory to center my work, constantly pulling me into an understanding of privilege and animality. When you are reading the work of vegans of color, the argument about purity or its sidekick exterminism take on not just a hollow ring, but a colonialist ring, a result of white privilege. We need to recall what foodways were destroyed by white colonialists the food heritage of indigenous pre-conquest Mesoamericans was destroyed, like the land itself was overrun. And the food practices that chefs like Bryant Terry are trying to reintroduce as foods of the African diaspora. So the charge of purity is a double hubris, defending colonial ways that have promoted meat and dairy and ignoring the food ways of people of color about that cream cheese. In By Any Greens Necessary, Tracy McWhorter points out that what is called lactose intolerance and seen as a deficiency is in fact a natural developmental occurrence experienced by the majority of the world's population. The Food Empowerment Project objects to the term lactose intolerance, which probably problematically implies people who happen to be predominantly people of color are abnormal if they do not digest lactose. They prefer the term lactose normal. Their definition is lactose normal refers to people, often people of color, whose bodies do di not digest the milk of a non-human animal. This leads us to another issue, the second one, purity and issues of control. Issues of purity matter to oppression because they justify control. Purity is an obsession of dominance when it comes to women as well. There is such a burden on women in a patriarchal culture to be virgins, to be pure. The notion of it, that you have to stay away from women and not be dirtied by women and women's bodies that have already be, been animalized that the vice president of the United States won't eat alone with a woman except his wife is all about purity. Remember the classical writings, you are the devil's gateway. We were the temptress, temptress who brought some away from purity. We brought the downfall of, of, uh, of humanity through the fall. So women are impure to begin with in, in the conceptualization or must work so hard to be pure Pure because who makes us impure? It's not us making ourselves impure. Well, that's a whole nother thing, sorry. Uh, all right, here's, here's purity. A woman not even born of a woman. This is Aphrodite, you know, who's born out of the sea. And here's a, a takeoff on this. This is milk from a cow who does not even have breasts. This is how purity gets re- positioned, you know, in popular culture. It's like Woody Allen's fixation on teenage girls. Legislators want to control young women's sexual options because they want young women to stay virgin, pure. Uh, it's thought that abortion politics around the world is really about an obsession about teenage girls' sexuality. Then there's the argument for purity from anti-abortionists. How can vegan animal rights activists be pro-choice? Cho pro we aren't being pure. We aren't trying to be pure. We are against forced pregnancy for any female of any species. Because let's remember what the opposite of pure for women is, bitch. One definition of bitch is someone available to be impregnated. But also, you're a bitch if you have an opinion, if you have a voice. We argue, we say no. So this is just an example of the kind of things that I'll get tagged for. You know, I just fi finished a delicious plate of bacon, I don't even want to read them. But you know, this, this constant reintroduction of a woman who is saying no to something like 
carnivorous patriarchy is a bitch. Emily Nussbaum, the Pulitzer Prize winning media journalist for The New Yorker, asked, I realize this is the world's sm sm smallest issue, but I still don't understand what I moved on her like a bitch means. For those of you who weren't living day to day during the 2016 presidential election, this is referring to Trump on this bus where he tells Billy Bush, I took her out, I took her out furniture. I moved on her like a bitch. This is our current president. So I want to help Emily Nussbaum understand what this means. Here's someone who was moved on like a bitch, a woman on a bus, illustrating bondage. Here is a do-it-yourself ear tag for a cow, bitch from hell. They moved on her like a bitch. She became hamburger. Here's a pig labeled fat, selfish bitch in Iowa, photographed by an undercover Mercy for Animals volunteer. They moved on her like a bitch too. Number 21288 became pork or bacon. He moved on her as though she were merely a bitch, a cow, a sow, a hen, an old biddy, a female available for sexual exploitation. He moved on her like someone with the impunity to impregnate a bitch, a dog, or as someone who could get a piece. And because he moved on her like a bitch, misogynists voted for him. It's the same thing happening with animal agriculture and the depiction of dead animals as female. They want us all to move on them like a bitch. This is from New Zealand. This is a meta ad, an ad for you to do advertising. This is from Italy. When feminists protested, they actually took it down. In the United States, they would have made more. This is from Brooklyn, another being to be moved on like a bitch. Italy again, a restaurant. Italy again, wanting to be moved on like a bitch. Southern United States, lots of fixation on mm, fleshy female bodies in barbecues. There's also a kind of participating in rape culture that I'm seeing now in these ads. Not only is it move on me like a bitch, but I want you to move on me like a bitch. Uh, from Portland. This is from Turkey. So that's that's the problem, the second problem with purity. Here's the third, purity and the politics of false compromise. So besides the purity's roots in racial and misogynistic discourse, it's that purity discourse accepts a false continuum, a narrative from emerging regressive forces. Factory farming, bad. We all agree factory farming, bad. Locavore, good. It's a middle ground. We can all accept that. And vegan, again, another linear continuum. Unachievable, taking things too far, the extreme. Now, this aspect was addressed in many ways and answered by Vasily Stanesco at the first Minding Animals conference in 2009. He shows that locavore is not honest in its killing, in its relationships with animals, is burdened by um, a variety of uh, um, sort of uh, extreme uh, viewpoints. But by fetishizing and demeaning veganism through this label of purity, our critique of animal agriculture and locavore meat eating disappears. For instance, I am so tired of hearing people quote the family farmer saying, our cows have only one bad day. See, this is where the purity discourse gets us. We've got to stay in the middle. We can't ever tend towards veganism. We have to accept that cows should have one bad day. I think it's very strange that we're allowing the farmers to tell us what the cows experienced, 
It's kind of like asking sexual harassers and exploiters to interpret their behavior. Why would we trust them? But wasn't it a bad day when she was taken from her mother so that her mother's milk could go to humans? These next three photos are from Joanne MacArthur, who's here. I hope you make it, make sure to hear her while, while you're in, at Minding Animals. Wasn't it a bad day to be taken away, separated, placed alone? Wasn't it a bad day when her calf was taken away from her? A whole group of residents of a small town called the police because they heard strange noises. And it turns out it was cows. And even you saw in the strange noises turned out to be cows missing their calves. The, the headline of the newspaper was sympathetic. And they had to retract some of that later on and say, oh, no, no, the cows weren't, weren't there was nothing bad was happening. Wasn't it a bad day when she was forcibly made pregnant again because her milk was drying up and then again? Wasn't it a bad day that she was both pregnant and lactating, which is kind of like jogging for six hours every day? And wasn't it a bad day each and every day that she's producing milk because she's been bred to produce more milk than is natural to her body? And so the weight of her udder causes strain to her back and hips, and she might not even be able to walk easily. And wasn't it a bad day when she got an infection and because the organic farm did not use antibiotics, a few days were spent discussing options before they decided that though she was only two and a half, she would have to go to slaughter. And that's all to make. David Foster Wallace, in his classic Consider the Lobster essay for Gourmet Magazine, own up to his discomfort holding the belief that animals are less morally important than human beings, and appended this footnote, meaning a lot less important, apparently, since the moral comparison here is not the value of one animal's life versus the value of one human's taste for a particular kind of protein, like bean soup. And so we find anti-purists making their compromise, not just locavore, but they'll tend to take food from factory farming if that's all they can choose, like that bean soup. So their critiques and all the purity offshoots, it's hard, food desert, exterminism, reflect a failure to incorporate a feminist ethic of care. It's not un recognizing an understanding of why someone might be a vegan, that it's about relationships and it's not about our bodies or some supposed privation but about connection and empathy. The cho choice is framed as either or. I will care about this and not that. This is their purity creating that framework. To see our caring as separation from the human community rather than involvement or engagement. I could have said again, I guess you haven't read this book I co-edited on the feminist ethics of care, but I didn't. So what does it mean to the animals being used for food? What these anti-exterminists and anti-purists continue to approve of is the sexual exploitation of animals in obtaining the sperm and in forcibly making females pregnant so that they can be moved on like a bitch. So this was sent to me by Julia Gutia, who is here today, and I've used it in one of my books. She wants you to move on her. She wants to give you one more pig per year, even though in reality she can't turn around for two and a half years. And this is an actual ad on Facebook from two years ago for a job in animal agriculture. This was sent from Soon Forkbelt. Thank you, Soon, who's also here today. So let me just say, if you see any of these over the next three years, send them to me, please. But this, this is moving on her like a bitch. This is an example of what I call chalk misogyny. Chicken is better than that chick who said she'll die for you. Chicken actually dies for you. So, political.
politically, I mean, this is also part of rape culture, but politically, how do you argue for a being seen to be without dignity? They are what we have done to them and become so lowered in status, we can not acknowledge how they might have lived different lives, lives with dignity, because we need them to be who they are in captivity. So finally, there's purity and the politics of the personal. So the idea is that purity reflects a problem, a hang-up, an individualist response, as opposed to compassion or an ethics of care, a process that includes grief. But purity is an ideological overreaching that depoliticizes, uh, they're depoliticizing us. It's causing the animal to disappear. The anti-purists, having put the label on us, their own purism disappears and it excuses their failure to act in good faith and keep veganism privatized and once privatized an excuse for passivity. Since we cannot live purely in this world, labeling veganism as purist offers a way to justify maintaining the violent and destructive status quo. Also, it comes with synonyms, hard, unachievable. So we have this result of intellectual passivity. It's unachievable, why try? Moreover, someone who tries to achieve the unachievable is out of touch. It's unattainable and us in error, so no one need participate in something predisposed to error and failure. Reflect personal dispositions while suggesting vegans have personal issues. They decide it's unfeasible because their own standpoint defines feasibility. What they view as impractical, purity, because they lack the imagination of how to do it, how to say no to cream cheese, or how to conceptualize the cow, who in the sexual politics of meat I've referred to as an absent reference. The other thing is that the ends purity is trying to achieve are not worth the means. It's hard. Just to clarify, this is not being said to me by people who live in low-income commu communities who have to take two buses to get their vegan food. This is being said by middle-class people who have access to vegan food. The last time I saw Marty was at the first Minding Animals conference in 2009. We went to dinner. We spent most of our time discussing caregiving. Each of us was participating in caregiving for parents, when and when suddenly this is your life and your love and your responsibility, of course it's hard. But being hard never enters into the equation of whether you do it or not. You do it because it's the right thing, and this is where the relationship evolves. This is part of entangled empathy, as Lori has identified it, that our agency is constructed by the relationships we are already in. If non-caregivers talk to caregivers about caregiving the way non-vegans do to vegans, we could see the ridiculousness of it. Oh, I couldn't give care to my mother who's at Alzheimer's. That would be too hard. I can't imagine someone saying that. No one has ever said that to me. In all the discussions I've had about caregiving over the years, no one, no one has ever said, I can't be a caregiver of my loved one because it's hard. It's immaterial to, what we do, to whether what we do is important. What is on the other side of hardness anyway? Does something remain hard? Rather than seeing a process, what is seen as a static experience? Later that year, after the Minding Animals won, my mother died and I was with her along with my sisters. In wanting to fulfill this relationship unto the parent's death, no one referred to this as pure. Footnote, I have written about caregiving and its influence on my veganism and my veganism's influence on caregiving here. Critical inquiry, I think it's available online on PDF, toward the philosophy of care through caregiving. And with Lori, I developed a uh, a, sen a paragraph about how my caregiving deepened my veganism. It, uh, my ve it affirmed my veganism, and my veganism kept me centered during extreme moments of caregiving. So when we did this book, Never Too Late to Go Vegan, we included the first chapter ever written, really, on veganism and caregiving, giving advice to vegans who are caregivers. The charge of purity drives out more nuanced narratives. We know we cannot be pure, cannot stop being beneficiaries of a world that takes animals' lives so care, 
casually. We're not attempting to achieve some purity of the body or overcome our fleshiness or our embodiedness. The feminist ethics of care embraces this embodiedness. Compassion may be feared to be endless. Then put an end to it by calling its practice purity. But compassion is openness and willingness to be vulnerable on behalf of the vulnerable. How much safer it is for it to be called purity or exterminism than to get into the muck of what it means to care. By holding to purist narratives, they don't see what veganism can bring to political resistance. And this is my last concern. The accusation of purity and other conceits to promote the status quo, or at least not shake things up too much, become politically regressive. For those of us in developed countries with means, veganism is a part of our resistance. And to use accusations that prevent a discussion about the real issues is dangerous. So very, very briefly, how veganism is part of the resistance. Climate change and vulnerable populations. We'll have a session tomorrow on climate change. Rod highlighted climate change. Uh, but climate change is going to especially affect vulnerable populations. And we know how much of climate change is driven by uh, the, the demand uh, or the uh, methane uh, and uh, carbon problems of animal agriculture. Vegan food justice, not just a concern for slaughterhouse workers, but for appropriate food for, for people, and the environmental racism in the placing of hog farms, uh, which is often near low income and, and uh, communities of color. To recognize misogyny is used in animal agriculture and has been just moved very seamlessly into um, confirming a sort of rape culture view of women. And it affirms compassion in a time of bullying and xenophobia. Also, vegan is an anti-teleological or progress narrative. And this is important, and I'll just quickly summarize it. There's a big concern that people in the United States especially are feel like, oh, our democracy can survive anything. So that's the teleological faith. Uh, nothing, you know, we're always progressing forward. But any vegan could say, this is not accurate. One third of the land mass of the world is devoted to animal agriculture. This is not progress. Um, also, this notion that humans are at the top of the food chain, that's, it, that's sort of optimistic faith and teleological progress. But vegans have a counter narrative to that. So vegan, veganism challenges the fictions that go along with the teleological narrative and perhaps equip us to see the real threats to democracy that can happen uh, when there's an attack on institutions and an attack on the press. Uh, we know what it is like to be attacked. We recognize how authoritarianism works. And we are equipped to help the resistance work on that. The first group labeled terrorists in the United States actively sought after were animal liberation and environmental liberation activists. And those tactics are now being used against Black Lives Matter and it was used against the Dakota Pipeline. We've been living with that kind of authoritarian labeling for 20 years. So again, you know, we bring some skills to resistance. I'm kind of proud of my new book, Burger, that considers regressive politics of settler colonialism as they contribute to the growth of hamburgers. After all, the cow is not native to North America, but, but was brought to this land mass by Spanish conquistadors and English colonists. Dominant, we might say dishonest, histories of the burger leave out colonialism, animals, and violence. And I propose that the hamburger is an exhausted modernist solution to protein delivery. So veganism is also part of the resistance in a very simple way. It helps with stress and depression. It equips us with, well, and that's because the foods themselves help, uh, vegan foods are found to help with stress and depression. You can email me if you want to know more information on that. It also equips us with skills to question propaganda and truncated narratives. Honesty versus fake news, propaganda, authoritarianism. We vegans know a lot about fake news. 
positive thing is that mongrelization overcomes dualism by combining. Veganism doesn't need a monist theory like right for utilitarianism. It mixes it up. Mongrelization is a positive force. What veganism and animal rights theory is more mongrelization. Enough with monist theory. Mongrel honesty favors the mix rather than the purebred. It's an openness to resist borders, imagined and imposed, politically and militarily secured. We are willing to transgress ground boundaries like the animals who cross borders, and to resist like the animals who run away from slaughterhouses or lobsters to try to climb out of boiling hot water. Feminist work for animals is in a unique position. It's been both disparaged and appropriated. It's very strange. Um, it reminds me of the philosophy professor who said to me, when I heard of your book, The Sexual Politics of Meat, I was impressed by how you treated with such a narrow topic. When I got over the shock, I said, narrow, to me, it encompasses the world. But when did it begin, this need to corral feminist thought about animals, to restrict it? My work got labeled structuralist, and Grease Harper was actually told she should not use my work, even though it was one of the few writings in the 90s that had anti-racist work in it when she worked on her PhD, because I was a structuralist. Meanwhile, vegan and animal rights groups say they want to show their commitment to social justice, but discourage participants from openly identifying with Black Lives Matter or abortion rights. Mongrel honesty includes a call to the animal rights movement to account for sexual harassment. This, too, was a concern of Marty. When she died, she was being sued by an abuser for slander, which is often the tactic sexual harassers take. Marty wrote that we can't have a cult of heroes and adulation, an unquestioning acceptance of top-down leadership, not only because it's authoritarian, but because it encourages uh, sexual exploitation. We've recognized now how many of the prominent men exposed as serial sexual exploiters in the United States, including Matt Lauer, Charlie Rose, Mark Halperin, used their power to shape a negative view of Hillary Clinton during the 2016 presidential campaign. And note, it was Marty who said we should not call serial sexual exploiters predators. Why are we defaming something animals naturally do? So we've been trying, you know, to campaign on Twitter to stop using predators for all these guys. Anyway, this writer wrote in the Times, these crooked n Hillary narratives pushed by Mr. Lauer, Mr. Halperin, and a long list of other prominent journalists and pundits indelibly shaped the election and were themselves gendered. Hillary Clinton as a cackling witch. Hillary Clinton, a woman it was easy to distrust because she was also a woman seeking power. And what kind of woman does that? Of course she was called a bitch. In the animal rights movement, do we have something similar going on? Not just activism that inscribes regressive masculinist attitudes that doesn't call to account bullying, but actually encourages us to be bullied. But we're now beginning to see how sexually abusive men have helped to shape the strategies and conversation within the animal rights movement, at least in the United States. And we're learning how many organizations tolerated abusive behavior for years. That approaches in animal activism were shaped by men who have abused and sexually exploited and sexually harassed women. What does this mean for conceptualizing, conceptualizing activist strategy? Marty Seal would have been in the center of this discussion. Mongrel honesty. Two months ago, my mother-in-law died. Just before she died, she asked me, am I going to get better? And I would not lie to her. She did not remember she had just agreed to go on hospice care. I asked her, what would better mean for you? As it did in the 1920s, mongrel honesty degenerates whiteness and white culture for white privilege, white assumptions, and now the diet of colonizers. When someone says, I'm a purist, I reply, I'm not a purist, I'm a mongrel. Look at you, you strain at and against purism simultaneously. An anti-war person is not a purist if they're against war. We're working against war. 
a feminist is not a purist if they're against misogyny. We're working against misogyny. A civil rights activist and Black Lives Matter activist is not a purist if they're against racism. We're working against white supremacy. And a vegan is not a purist if they're against the consumption of animals and animal products. We are working against the death and suffering of animals. This vegan is doing this as part of her, human, her vision for social justice and sees these all as in, interconnected. Maybe that's our perfect pitch. And this, to me, is mongrel honesty. Thank you. conversation with you about these ideas. Thank you so much. Uh, before, before you leave, uh, this is just a small token uh, of uh, an interesting appreciation and for leadership and appreciation for our folks as well as uh, participation. So thank you, Carol. Uh, sorry about the air conditioning or the fact that it's cold in here. We, we can't do anything about that. Also, we have a problem having microphones in here, so we'll need to talk up. And uh, that's about it, isn't it? So is we have no microphones, air conditioning? No, 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 no questions, but... So it's the later lecture that we'll do that. So we, we can uh, now um, go out for coffee. Uh, just, uh, just please follow the signs and then have a look at your books uh, for the rooms where you'll uh, 